Evil in Chains, the Millennium. A group of Arctic explorers were stranded on a rocky, barren island. Their supplies were rapidly running out. They had eaten their last few morsels of food. Their fuel supply was low. The temperature was dropping fast and they were freezing. They prepared themselves for the worst. They knew that death would soon come. Just when they were giving up hope, one of the dying explorers noticed a puff of smoke on the horizon. Someone had picked up their shortwave radio signal. Help was on the way. Deliverance was coming. The puff of smoke on the horizon was all they needed to encourage them to hang on. Soon the long nightmare of that horrible ordeal would be over. Soon they would be secure in the warmth of the rescue vessel. And then soon after they would be home at last. In the same way, Jesus doesn't want us to give up hope either. In this world which is marred by sin, we need to keep looking to him and his promises. He loves us, already paid the ultimate price for us and considers us too valuable to give up on now. In our darkest hours, he still wants us to have hope. And the last book of the Bible, Revelation, reveals that help is indeed on the way. The long nightmare of sin will be over. Soon we too will be delivered and Satan will be imprisoned. We will be set free and Satan will be bound. We will be caught up into the sky to meet Jesus and Satan will be chained by circumstances to this earth. We will receive the reward of eternal life and Satan will and his followers will receive the sentence of eternal destruction. Unusually long sentences are often handed down to express the outrageousness of a terrible crime. Often the criminal can't possibly serve that long, as it would be several lifetimes. But did you know that the day is coming when a judge will hand down a prison sentence of 1,000 years? and the criminal will serve every day of that sentence. Listen to these words from the last book of the Bible. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 to 3. Here we find that God has a plan to deal with the greatest criminal this universe has ever known, a criminal directly involved with every sin and crime ever committed on this earth. He will be imprisoned for 1,000 years. Sometimes this time period is referred to as the millennium. The word millennium means a 1,000 years and comes from two Latin words, milli, meaning 1,000, and annum, meaning year. In order to understand this prophecy of the millennium, we need to find out how it starts and ends, and what happens throughout its duration. First we will notice that the, this millennium is defined on either end by a resurrection. The resurrection of life at the beginning of the millennium. The resurrection of damnation at the end of the millennium. Let's see how the Bible describes these two resurrections. One day, when Jesus was speaking with his disciples about death, he said, 
Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. John 5.25 Notice that Jesus didn't just talk about the righteous being resurrected. He says that all the dead will one day hear his voice and be raised from the dead. Notice how Jesus makes this even more clear in a few verses later. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. John 5.28 Notice the two resurrections. First, the resurrection of those who have done good and the second one, the resurrection of damnation. The book of Revelation is also very clear about what distinguishes these resurrections. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. The righteous being raised first is in harmony with what the Apostle Paul told the Thessalonians. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. What a glorious description of the resurrection. You will notice that the dead in Christ will be raised first, and then the followers of Jesus who are alive will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. On that day, Jesus' promise will be fulfilled. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. John 11 verse 25. Yes, the righteous dead will be raised from their graves when Christ returns. Isaiah describes this joyous event. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 19. What a glorious day that will be. Mothers being reunited with their babies who died. Husbands and wives reunited. Sons and daughters reunited with their mums and dads. Could anything be more exciting? Then the promise Jesus made so long ago will be fulfilled. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. John 14, verses 2 and 3. This is where the saved will spend the millennium, with Jesus, where he is now. But what will the redeemed be doing during the 1,000 years after the first resurrection? John tells us, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 to 6. The all-wise, all-powerful God of the universe will include the redeemed in the solemn task of reviewing the records and confirming the judgment of the fallen angels and those who are lost. Paul states, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? 
Do you not know that we shall judge angels? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. Throughout this transparent process, everyone will have the opportunity to see that God is just and loving and honest. For thousands of years, Satan has attacked the character of God. He has claimed that God is a selfish tyrant, demanding obedience and worship. But the thousand years will provide an opportunity for the saved to see behind the scenes and examine God's interactions with every person and angel who is lost. It's an opportunity for God's character and dealings to be on full, transparent display. It's not that God can't judge on his own. But what if you get to heaven and find someone you knew and loved is missing? You may sometime throughout the millions of years of eternity be tempted to doubt whether God was fair and just or not. During the millennium, the records of the lost will be opened. The thoughts and secrets of hearts will be made known. And in his dealings with every single person, God's unconditional, unselfish love will be fully demonstrated. Those inspecting the records will be left with only one response. Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Revelation chapter 16, verse 7. You may be wondering, what happened to those who are alive when Jesus comes, but not saved and taken to be with Jesus during the millennium? The Apostle Paul makes it very clear in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, that the Lord will consume them with the breath of his mouth and destroy them with the brightness of his coming. It will be humanely impossible for the lost to survive in the presence of the glory of the second coming of Christ with all of his holy angels. Only one angel arrived at Jesus' tomb on his resurrection morning and the Roman soldiers became incapacitated. Imagine being in the presence of millions upon millions and Jesus himself. The Bible says, And at that day, the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. Jeremiah 25 verse 33. At the second coming of Christ, the righteous are resurrected and translated to meet Jesus in the clouds, while the unsaved will be slain by the brightness of his coming, by the sword that goes out of his mouth. Revelation chapter 19 verse 21. But what about the unsaved who were still in their graves when at the second coming? Well, Revelation tells us the answer. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Revelation chapter 20 verse 5. It's all becoming clear now, isn't it? These are the events the Bible describes as defining the millennium. Jesus will return with all of the holy angels. You can see that in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. The dead in Christ will rise in the first resurrection. See 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The living saved will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. See 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. The redeemed all go home with Jesus and reign with him for 1,000 years. See Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 and 6. The unsaved perish in the presence of Christ at the second coming. 
See Jeremiah 25, verse 33. The unsaved dead remain dead and are not resurrected until after the 1,000 years. See Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. Satan is bound during the 1,000 years by a chain of circumstances. There won't be anyone alive on earth to tempt or destroy. See Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 3. The righteous are in heaven and all the wicked are dead. Earth is in complete ruins. See Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23 to 26. This earth becomes the devil's prison. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 to 3. How is Satan imprisoned? The lost are all dead. The saved are in heaven. There's no one to tempt or destroy during the 1,000 years. He had wanted to be ruler over this planet and now he has his chance to contemplate how his rebellion against God destroyed it. God's character of love has been fully revealed. And now the devil's character of destructive selfishness will be completely demonstrated. The Greek word translated bottomless pit is the word abusos. From this word we have the English word abyss. It literally means nothingness or a void. There is also a Hebrew word that is equivalent, tihu which was used in the Old Testament to describe the word in its chaotic state before creation. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens, they had no light. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23. Yes, this world will be so completely destroyed by the events leading up to and surrounding the second coming that it will once again be like it was before God at creation brought order and organisation to the planet. It's described as an abyss or bottomless pit. Notice how Jeremiah describes the earth in its destroyed state. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 24 to 27. That certainly sounds like a grim place to spend a thousand years, wouldn't you agree? Satan and his angels will be left with nothing to do but reflect on their rebellion against God. Let's review the circumstances during the millennium. The earth is devastated and desolate. See Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 24 to 27. All the unsaved are dead, slain by the brightness of Jesus coming. See Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 21. All the saved are in heaven reigning with Christ. See Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Satan is bound on this desolate planet with no one to deceive. See Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 3. Will a thousand years of reflection 
bring a, a change to Satan's heart? Absolutely not. The devil and his angels will prove that even if God were to give them additional opportunities, they would still make the same decision to rebel against him. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Revelation chapter 20 verses 7 and 8. Once again, the devil will be the deceiver. But where do all these people come from after the millennium? Remember, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Revelation chapter 20 verse 5. The rest of the dead, or the lost, are raised back to life in the resurrection of damnation or condemnation that Jesus talked about. This takes place at the end of the millennium. What a sight it will be to see the wicked dead raised to life. It will be a vast number of all the wicked who have ever lived, alive at one time. John says their number is as the sand of the sea, Revelation chapter 20, verse 8. It must be that at this time... The holy city, New Jerusalem, will have been brought to earth after the millennium. For the devil and his followers are described as attempting one last desperate effort to retain the planet. Now when a thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea, Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Satan and his evil angels deceive the lost yet again. Again, the unsaved choose the master rebel as their leader. Satan organises them into one vast army determined to take the new Jerusalem by force. This is earth's last battle. But how will it all end? They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Revelation chapter 20 verse 9. What a tragic end for these individuals when it could have been so different. Many misunderstand the Bible's teaching on hellfire, believing that hell is a place of torture that exists now and where the lost will be tormented throughout all of eternity. But the Bible teaches that hell is hotter than that. It will destroy the wicked, not torture them forever and ever. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi chapter 4 verse 3. The wages of sin is not eternal pain and punishment, but eternal death. The Bible never tells us that the wicked will have eternal life too, in hell or anywhere else. But what about the Jesus um, what about Jesus' words that the fires of hell will never be quenched? Here is what he said. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame, rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Mark chapter 9 verse 45. This expression is similar to how we might describe a house fire, so ferocious that the fire department was not able to put it out. It's not that we think the house is going to burn forever, but we understand that the fire will consume everything before it burns itself out. In fact, the Bible elsewhere uses the same expression to describe how Jerusalem would be destroyed. 
Then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the places of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 27. But doesn't the Bible say that hell's fire is eternal? Yes. But that fire doesn't burn eternally. The effects of the fire are eternal, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude 7. Sodom and Gomorrah aren't still burning, but they were eternally destroyed. But what about Revelation's warning against receiving the mark of the beast and suffering the wrath of God? He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends for ever and ever. Revelation chapter 14, verses 10 and 11. Does this verse contradict the others that speak of the annihilation of the wicked? Once again, we should seek to understand what the term forever means in the Bible. In the Old Testament, from which much of the language of Revelation is borrowed, the phrase is used to mean as long as life lasts. Servants who decided to continue serving their masters after the release on the seventh year were to have a special ceremony performed on them. And if it happens that he says to you, I will not go away from you because he loves you and your house since he prospers with you, then you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be your servant forever. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 16 and 17. Hellfire will not be escaped or recovered from. It will burn up sin and sinners completely and last as long as it needs until everything is consumed. Think about it, friend. Would a God of love miraculously sustain and give immortality to the lost in hellfire just so they could be tortured eternally? Would we enjoy eternity knowing that our loved ones were being perpetually tortured? No. God's plan is much better than this. The lost would not be happy in a place without sin and selfishness. God loves them so much that he respects their choices. He won't force them to be in heaven. Yes, the fire that comes from God will exact justice and some will pay a higher price than others. See Luke chapter 12, verse 47 and 48. But when all is done, sin and sinners will be no more, and the universe will be restored to perfection. In fact, even the devil will be completely burned up. The Bible tells us, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, verses 10 to 15. Therefore I brought fire from your midst, and it devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you, all who knew you, among the peoples, are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. 
Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 18 and 19. This final destruction of sin and sinners, the devil and even death and the grave was also described by Peter. The heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 10 Satan, his angels, sinners and even sin will be finally and forever destroyed. We may have dearly loved relatives, friends or acquaintances who will be gone forever. Of course, we will cry. How could it be otherwise? But we will not be alone in our grief. The heart of God will also weep for his children who refused his love. No one loved them more than he did. He gave his life to save them, but they refused. And yet our loving, unselfish God will not be thinking of himself, but will be comforting us. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. What a glorious eternity God promises the saved. The human mind cannot comprehend the glory and beauty of the paradise that God is preparing for those who love him and are willing to follow him and to think that all of this, the wicked could have enjoyed, but the price seemed too high. They were unwilling to choose Christ as their Saviour and Lord. Which group will you be in on that day, my friend? When that day comes, it will be too late to change sides. The only way to be absolutely sure that you are among the righteous at the end of the millennium, is to give your heart and life entirely to Jesus now, today. Is there anything in this world worth missing heaven for? Is there anything in this world worth missing eternity over? Today, is God speaking to your heart? Perhaps there is something in your heart, something in your life that has been holding you back from making a decision for Jesus. But today you see the beauties of heaven and the glories of eternity and you say, God, I don't want anything to hold me back. I want to surrender everything to Jesus. I just want to fully commit my life to you. If that is your desire today, then I invite you to stand together with me. I want to have a special prayer for those of you who are making decisions. Some of you are making decisions to dedicate your life to Jesus in baptism. And I want to have prayer for you. Some of you have wandered from Christ and now you want to rededicate your life to him through re-baptism. If you've sensed God's voice calling you to follow him all the way in Bible baptism, please let us know. Let the person know who shared this with you or contact us. Don't put off such an important decision. Now is the time to choose where we will be during the millennium. When we make a decision to follow Christ, we're saying, Jesus, I'm yours. Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus, I love you with all my heart. I believe I've found the truth of your word. I want to be a part of your commandment-keeping, Sabbath-keeping people. I want to unite with those around the world 
who are making this decision. Lord, this is my desire. This is my heart cry. This is my plea. There are those today who are thinking about this decision. It's a decision you're struggling with. You sense God leading you, but it's, it's hard to step out. If you want me to pray for you, if you're not quite ready to make that decision, but you want me to pray for you, then please let us all know also. We will be praying for you. There are some of you who have a problem in your life. It's too big and you don't know how to deal with it. Perhaps you feel it stands between you and making the decision you know is the right decision. I want to pray for you today. Would you join with me now as we pray? Lord, today we've seen how much you care for us and long to be with us. You want all of us to make our own decision. May you be with those who have made a decision for you today to not allow anything in this world to get in their way of being with you. Guide them each day from now until the day we all see you again soon, face to face. I want to pray also especially for those who are struggling with this decision today. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would guide them in your ways of truth and lead them each day. Help them to see your beauty and your love for them. May they be attracted by you and desire to be in your presence. Guide us all according to your will. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.